Focus on Aging Adults is sponsored in part by AARP. Our story begins more than 60 years ago inside an abandoned chicken coop where our founder discovered a retired teacher living. No home, no health care. So she said no to this injustice and yes to transforming lives. It's this drive, this compassion that inspired AARP. Today, we empower people to choose how they live as they age. We advocate for health and financial security. We strengthen communities everywhere. We are AARP Pennsylvania, creating real possibilities. Pennsylvania has one of the largest aging populations in the country. Our aging adults are vibrant, active contributors to our society. PCN, in partnership with AARP, present Focus on Aging Adults. Welcome to Focus on Aging Adults. I'm Larry Casper. This program is brought to you in partnership between PCN and the AARP of Pennsylvania. Today we're talking about Governor Shapiro's new state budget proposal. Our guests are Roy Offlerbach, founder and president of the Offlerbach Group and a former state senator, and Bill Johnston Walsh, director of AARP of Pennsylvania. Before we dig into the governor's budget proposal, Bill, uh, would you tell us about some of the basic needs for seniors that state government pays for? Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Um, first, I just want to talk a little bit about AARP, though, you know, just to let people know that we have 1.8 million members here in, in the Commonwealth. Um, we uh, are a 50 plus membership organization. And we really focus in on advocacy, outreach, and education for all our members. So this fits right in uh, with regards to you know, what we do and, and, um, and how we are out there representing our 1.8 million members and those over the age of 50. Um, we, we were very excited you know, with, with regards to the, the uh, governor's um, budget proposal because you know, we, as, we, as we move forward, we know that there's 3.4 million uh, uh, individuals here in Pennsylvania that are over the age of 60. And that's only going to continue to grow. Uh, we know that there's going to be a one in three. By 2030, there's going to be one out of every three people in the, in the Commonwealth that will be over the age of 60. So we have to make sure that we have the programs and the policies in place to be able to, to make sure that everyone is getting what they need and they can, they can age uh, respectfully um, and age in place. Um, we have a great network here in Pennsylvania. We have uh, a funding mechanism through the lottery fund, which no other state has the way we do here in Pennsylvania. Um, we also have an outstanding area agency on aging, the AAA network, that really, on a county level, that really impacts and is there to support um, older Pennsylvanians on a daily basis. And they have a whole gamut of, of programs and policies that they, that they deal with, from housing, transportation, Meals, they have the Meals on Wheels program. Um, there's guardianship, protection of, of, of older Pennsylvanians. Um, Health care, they have an options program. Um, they have the waiver program. They also have long-term care support um, that, that is out there for, for those. Uh, Bill, stop for a minute and tell us more about the waiver program. What do you mean by that? Well, I'll let, I will let uh, Roy talk a little <laughs> bit more in depth. So the waiver program really is for those on, on low-income individuals um, that, that uh, really need the support but don't have the dollars. The options program are the, for those more middle class that, that, um, that are out there trying to stay in their homes as long as possible mm -hmm. because we know that the longer someone stays in their home, it saves the Commonwealth dollars. Um, and so we want to be able to keep them in their homes. So if there's something that they can do where they can have a, an activity of daily living, someone can cook a meal for them or can clean their house or get them dressed, um, help them with their medications, mm -hmm. something that small um, would be able to keep somebody in and will be saving a lot of money both for the Commonwealth as well as for the individual. Yes, to, to make it a little more uh, clear as to where the money comes from, uh, the waiver program is Medicaid dollars. And in Pennsylvania, that's about 50% federal and 50% state. We're somewhere in that uh, middle range area. So when those dollars come in, obviously, they're for the very poorest people, as Bill had mentioned. Uh, the options program that is funded entirely by the lottery 
uh, is the group of people who do not qualify for Medicaid because they have too many assets, too much income, whatever it may be, but are still nevertheless in need of the very same kinds of services. And that's also a graduated program in the sense that people help to pay toward the services themselves. So if they're just above the Medicaid line, they may get funded at 100% through the options program for those services. But as they move up with a higher income level, uh, they pay more and more until they finally um, uh, come out of the program because their income is high enough to support things. And why is that one program called the waiver program? Sounds like something's being waived, right? <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, the, the federal government, uh, as you know, uh, guarantees placement in a skilled nursing facility if, in fact, an individual reaches that stage where they must be in a nursing facility. Mm -hmm. uh, some years ago, they amended the Medicaid program to allow individuals to be able to live in the community and still receive services if they are, in fact, nursing facility eligible, and if uh, E is often the uh, expression. So it's a waiver from the federal government to allow these monies to be spent for people living in the community rather than having to go to an institution. I see. And how well, in general, has state government funding kept up with the demand for uh, the services and programs uh, we're talking about today? In general now, not necessarily yeah. uh, applied to the brand new budget. <laughs> exactly. Roy, you better go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it has been a continuing challenge, and it became an even greater challenge back in 2010 when the state was beginning to cut programs significantly. At that time, a number of programs were cut, and in addition to that, uh, when uh, coming out of that period of time, uh, when we thought there'd be a catch-up period, there was never really a catch-up period. And so many of the uh, services, uh, adult day services, for example, have not had a rate increase for the provision of those services in uh, nearly 14 years. Well, you know what has happened with inflation in that period of time. And we have had more people requiring the need of those services as well. And that's been across the board for all these kinds of services. But before, before we go any further, uh, let me just explain for those who are watching exactly what a budget is when we talk about these programs. It's more than just an accumulation of numbers. Uh, for those who went to Kutztown University, as I did some years ago, they may remember Professor uh, Klosaritz uh, in the political science department. In the very first course, on the very first day of class, Bill Klosaritz would ask everybody, who knows what a budget is? And, of course, people began talking about, well, it's this expenditures here, it's revenue there, etc. He said, here's what a budget is. It is the single greatest policy document that a body will do, a legislative body in Congress or in the state or in the city council, single greatest policy document a party will do every year. Because it doesn't matter what we say is policy, if we don't fund it, it can't be done. Mm -hmm. So the budget is its greatest statement of policy. And that's something we'll get into a little bit later as to how that's impacted with what the uh, Governor uh, Shapiro has suggested for this uh, coming year. And, and I just want to add on that because you're right. People just look at budgets as a bunch of numbers. Mm -hmm. It's not a bunch. Of, it is. It, well, it is a bunch of numbers. It is uh, pieces of, of dollars that are going to go back mm -hmm. to, to these. But it's also you have to look at the budget in these programs. There's faces behind them. You know, it. it Everyone that is utilizing these are, it's, again, it's your grandmother, it's your aunts, it's your uncles, it's your parents. These are the individuals that are utilizing these programs and they're keeping them safe and in the community as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not just numbers, it's people and faces behind all of these numbers. So which service or program, again, in general, needs a, a funding increase right now in order to keep up with demand? Oh, gosh, just about all of them. Yeah. Just about There's all so of them. There's so many. Yeah. Try to yes. identify the most important well, one. or the bi How about the biggest one, Roy? Well, the biggest one is clearly the Medicaid dollars coming in. There's $5 billion a year spent on Medicaid. But that runs across the gamut from small children all the way up to and including older adults. So when one begins to funnel that out and go into the Community Health Choices Program, which uh, the Department of Human Services began a few years ago, specifically targeted to older adults uh, for the most part. There's some individuals with disabilities that qualify for that as well. Uh, there's about 114 um, million dollars that comes out of one pot and a couple of billion that comes out of this pot and so on and all this adds up to about a five billion dollar total for Medicaid but in mm. terms of specifically targeted to older adults now we're looking at the Department of Aging and we're looking at the lottery program and we're looking at the area agencies on aging 
which is the single largest uh, entity within all of that, because it's up to these 52 area agencies on aging, um, many of which are single county, but obviously there's some multi-county to hit 52 out of 67 counties. Uh, they are the ones that are responsible for funneling the Older Americans Act dollars that come in from the federal government, and also the lottery dollars uh, for the programs that they then, uh, and services uh, that they then provide. And those include everything from assessing an individual to determine what their needs may be, and then recommending what programs would be available to fill those needs. So you may in fact have an individual come in whose needs are assisted living, or maybe domiciliary care, or domiciliary care. I've always had trouble with that word. Uh, or maybe even nursing care. But more hmm. often it's something like home care visits or adult day services or something of that nature. The AAAs begin that process with the assessment of the clinical needs of the individual and also the financial ability of the individual to pay or whether or not they would qualify for the options program or the Medicaid program. And that's where we really need to put the money, is into the ability of the AAAs to be able to uh, do these kinds of things that they do and make the recommendations. And our viewers ought to know that you work with the AAAs, don't you? The I area do. agencies on aging. Yes, uh, I started working with them about 15 months ago. And one of the reasons why was because all the other clients I represent, which are the senior centers, the adult day service centers, the Meals on Wheels right. folks, all of those folks, this is a network. Not one of them can serve the problem only by itself. By itself. By itself. That's right. And the AAAs sit at the top of that network, uh, as I've just mm. explained. So it was mm. extremely important for me to be able to begin representing them as well as the other smaller entities. And I think, and I think the other thing, too, is you just have to keep in mind that over the past couple of years, I would say even the last 10 to 15 years, um, the aging network has either been flat funded mm -hmm. or they've had less mm -hmm. dollars coming in. So this, you'll, we'll be talking more about this, but this will be the first time in a long time that the AAAs are having an increase in their dollars. Yes, a substantial increase. We did manage to get $5 million more million into the uh, pen care program, which is what funds the options we were talking about. It's just a difference in names, a pen care program. Mm -hmm. And this year, of course, the governor has uh, projected an additional $10 million, uh, coming into it, which again, across 67 counties and 52 AAAs is not a whole lot of money, but every little bit helps as they're trying to catch up. If we were to fill the gap at one time, just because of what inflation has taken, and as Bill had mentioned, the fact that there was no additional increases for a number of years, we'd be looking at $50 million at one time. And that's just not going to happen, so we need to piecemeal our way into getting to where we need to be. In addition to that $10 million, the governor's proposed an additional $5.2 million to, again to go into the pen care program, but that is targeted specifically for emergency housing. Those individuals who may need emergency housing because of a protective services order or because they're coming out of uh, prison or coming out of jail and they don't have any housing available until mm -hmm. they get back on their feet, you know, we're, we are discharging, believe it or not, for a lot of incarcerated individuals who are now older adults in Pennsylvania. And to have them to start over fresh without some sort of assistance is just not uh, practical nor reasonable. Uh, let's take a brief detour around the governor's budget just for a moment because mm -hmm. after all we did bring up Medicaid and, and that made me think about uh, there's a bill out there, some legislation and the bill would allow personal care homes and assisted living mm -hmm. to accept payment from uh, Medicaid. Yes. We well, thought uh, we what, had, what's we, happening there? We, any, can we, you add any detail to we, that? We Roy? thought we solved that problem some years ago. Oh? But yes, we thought we did. By when you were a legislator, uh, perhaps? No. no. I, I've been out of the legislature <laughs> for quite a while. But, but uh, we talked about it then, but we didn't solve it. But we didn't solve it a few years ago either uh -huh. when, when the legislature thought they did by authorizing, they thought, the use of Medicaid dollars for assisted living facilities specifically. Yeah. We're one of the few states that does not. One of the very few states that does not. Uh, but the, the legislature put this general policy out there and successive administrations just simply never implemented it. So the legislation you're talking about now would be much more specific. It would require the administration to implement it. Hmm. And that's what we're looking at uh, as a possibility. Now, there I are wonder if there's legislative support out there for this. Uh, as with all things, there are some. If there's enough, we don't really know because mm -hmm. you're looking at a greater expenditure of Medicaid dollars. Right. And as I said earlier, at least 50% of those Medicaid dollars are state dollars, which coming out of the general fund, with one exception, uh, some years ago the legislature began shifting lottery funds over to the general fund specifically to uh, make part of the state match for Medicaid. So there's $349 million a year taken out of the lottery last year and again proposed for this coming year to be used as part of that Medicaid match. 
if the legislation passes directing and, and requiring the administration to apply Medicaid to assisted living, mm -hmm. uh, we can expect that there will be more Medicaid dollars required. On the other side of that, however, assisted living is less expensive than institutional care in a nursing facility. So can the two offset one another? Uh, some of us believe they can, and those are the people who would be supporting this particular bill. And there are some in the, the legislature, um, right or wrong, that believe mm -hmm. that it's, it's called the woodworking effect. Mm -hmm. They believe that, that all of these people will be coming out of the woodwork, you know, once they pass this, yes. to, to start collecting on this, and they don't know where the money is going to come from, or at least part of the money is going to come from, right. we know, mm -hmm. uh, at least the state portion of it. So mm -hmm. there, there's, always, there's always that. Um, we just, it was funny, ARP just did a study with Harvard University, and we basically debunked that. Mm -hmm. We basically said there, there is no woodworking effect, you mm -hmm. know, especially between... Uh, assisted living, those lower than the long-term care facilities, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, if to keep them in their home, again, as, as Roy said, it would cost less to the state budget um, over the long term to keep them in their homes as long as possible. And that's what... And, and out of an institution. And out of yes. an institution, yes. that mm -hmm. is correct. Mm -hmm. and, what, and what would cost even less is what we call uh, older adult uh, daily living centers in Pennsylvania, otherwise often referred to uh, as adult day centers. Uh, they leverage the ability of the individual family to keep their loved one at home during the night and allow them to go to the adult daily living center during the daytime, mm -hmm. where they receive the very same, in, in many of the centers, not all of them, but in many of the centers, they receive the same quality care, including medication and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, that they would if they were in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility. And, and again, when I say it's less expensive, uh, this is not something I'm just making up or coming from government. Uh, take a look at the Genworth cost of living, which is in private insurer that pays for these things. And every year they put out a cost of living upgrade as to what it is across all these different types of services from adult day to assisted living to a skilled nursing facility in all 50 states. And you will see consistently that adult day is about half the cost of assisted living, which is about half the cost of skilled nursing facility. And again, you have to realize, too, that the adult daycare is able to give the caregiver, the family member, allows them during the day to go out to work. It allows right. them to, to, to get some time back for themselves. And the senior can get out of the house and, and the socialize. Exactly. exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. So it, it's a, it's a win-win yeah. across the board for everyone. Absolutely. Now, and then people will say, well, are, are these senior community centers? Are they the same thing? And the answer is no, they're not. And here's the easiest way to remember the difference between a senior community center and an adult daily living center. Uh -huh. If an individual is sufficiently physically able and mentally cognizant to be able to self-direct, then the community senior center is the place to go, where they can have social interaction with other people, they get a good nutritious meal, at least one during the day when they go there, and they have all kinds of other activities in which they can participate. If, however, that individual reaches a stage where they are no longer sufficiently cognizant or sufficiently physically able mm -hmm. to be able to self-direct and they need mm -hmm. some degree of assistance, whatever that may be, then the adult day uh, center or, or the um, um, community... Or the the um, daycare right center? Yet. Yes. I want to make sure I get them yes. sorted out. Yes, that's right. The adult day ser services center. It's, it's, it's adult daycare, essentially. Uh -huh. And that would be the place for the individual who can no longer self-direct to go to a community senior center. Uh -huh. And how big is this network in general, including both of those uh, kinds of places, Roy? In other words, is it an expanding business in Pennsylvania? Yes. Obviously, we yeah. have more demand because we keep hearing that we're, we're going to have more older Pennsylvanians. Yes, yeah. Well, COVID took its shot, no question about it. I was going to get yeah. into that. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, the nursing homes continue to function because they absolutely had to. But in Pennsylvania and in a few other states, adult day centers were just flatly, essentially put out of business. Uh, they were not allowed to take additional clients in uh, during that period of time. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we had a two-tier system. Uh, for a period of time, no adult day center in Pennsylvania was permitted to open and take clients in. Now, you know, they were given COVID and money some and so on to help them exist. existing ones had to go out of business? Uh, some existing ones did go out of business mm -hmm. because they couldn't withstand the length of time they had to be closed. Right. And then we had, in, in Philadelphia particularly, uh, all of the adult day centers down there were closed for essentially a full year. And, of course, you know, we were able to get some COVID funds from the federal government, right. AR, ARP funds and so on, uh, to be able to at least give them money to be able to pay the rent and pay the lights, even though they weren't getting any customers in at that time. So they really took a hit. Now they're beginning to come back again. And there are more centers being licensed in Pennsylvania, adult day uh, centers now being licensed, hmm. because the need is there. There's no question about that. And then when it comes to the community senior centers, they're overseen and work in conjunction with your area agencies on aging. And presently, we have about 450 
uh, community senior centers across the state. Mm -hmm. And again, they also took a hit during Pretty good COVID. geographic distribution statewide? Yes, yeah. Pretty good with those, yes. Not with adult day centers, because adult day centers are more expensive to operate, and you have to have a certain number of, of uh, clientele uh, coming in to be able to continue to operate them. Uh, but in community senior centers, because they are paid for in great part by the Older Americans Act, uh, we can do a broader distribution across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns with the adult daycare centers is exactly mm -hmm. the, what Roy was talking about. Um, so even though Philadelphia was was hit because they, mm -hmm. you know, they kept them closed, they, there are mm -hmm. more coming online right mm -hmm. now to, to be able to help with that with that need. But the more rural areas of the state. They they are they are low on the adult air, right. day, daycare centers, and we you know that's one of the issues that we you know mm. with this uh, you know uh, master plan that which I'm sure we're going to be talking about in a little bit would really help with regards to expanding those, especially in in the more rural areas of, of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into the details of the governor's uh, new budget proposal, then one more question. It has to do with the COVID pandemic. So, does that have any lingering effect on budget considerations? today? Well, it does, but the lingering effect is because the COVID money is going away. So that and that was the next see, question. Yes. How much is left? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, I, because it's mixed in with that $14 billion in the so-called rainy day fund. There's a certain amount of it that's mixed in there. Um, but I do know that when we look at the line items in the governor's proposed budget, you will see certain line items where an amount is being deducted because the COVID money is no longer available. And so there are several such line items throughout the entire budget. So we're still in that period of transition then, even as this Absolutely. new budget. Absolutely. And, yeah. I, and I think you have to also remember, so yes, there's that mm -hmm. aspect of mm -hmm. it, but there's also the aspect of it that, that the dollars were cut during COVID mm -hmm. and we're trying to get back. Like, we want to get them back. We want to get right. back up to the levels that we need to, to be able to. Pre-pandemic levels is the phrase yes. we keep hearing. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's yes. exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I was just asked the other day by someone who actually read through the budget as it's published online already and said right. that there's an additional $219 million in there for community health choices, which I mentioned earlier serves uh, primarily older adults. You know, where are they getting that money? Well, it's Medicaid money. So that $219 million that is proposed in the governor's budget is coming out of the state general funds at the present time. There's been no indication that they want to take more out of the lottery fund at this point, but they could just mm -hmm. as they've been doing all these years. So that's one of the things that we need to keep a close eye on. How are they going to replace this COVID money? Now let's talk mm -hmm. more about Governor Shapiro and his mm -hmm. new budget proposal. Now he's been in office for just over a year. So mm -hmm. just in general, how would you rate his performance for Pennsylvania seniors, Bill? Um, I, I think he's doing very well. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's been working closely with the legislature to make sure that older Pennsylvanians um, are being taken care of. Um, he did that with the property tax and rent rebate program. Uh, that that was expanded last year. And there's talk, talk of expanding it again. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So, um, and he was able to do that with the, the support of the legislature. Um, he's also been very involved with this master plan on aging. It's also mm -hmm. called Aging My Way PA, right. um, which really looks at aging programs and policies over the next 10 years. It was something that he had talked about when he was running to be governor, and he kept that promise when he came in. So uh, the Department of Aging, uh, led by the Secretary Kovulic, um, has really been taking the lead on that. And they've, they've gone out for public comment over the last, um, I don't know, uh, seven, eight, nine months, and basically have had, had a lot of comments coming in across the Commonwealth, really mm -hmm. focusing in on what are going to be the needs of this, uh, you know, this growing population, that one in three uh, individuals over right. the age of 60 by This, by this master plan for older adults has been referred to as a, a roadmap for the next mm -hmm. 10 years. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. What kind of guidelines did the governor give to the Department of Aging for coming up with this uh, final report, which is due in just a matter of days, by the way, mm -hmm. or at least uh, it will become uh, open to the public for their comment. Their comments. Right. Yeah. By the mm -hmm. end of this week on the 17th, I think it is, um, uh, there will be open for a 30 day uh, period. Uh, but a lot of comments have, have come in. The guideline really uh, from the governor, from my understanding, and, and Roy, correct me if I'm wrong, but has really, it was an open guideline. What is going to be in the best interest? And he wanted to hear from everyone across the board, not just the industry, mm -hmm. not just legislative uh, or elected officials, but the people that are benefiting from 
some of these programs. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to hear from everyone, and I think they did a very good job of getting that out there and hearing from everyone across the Commonwealth. And the Department of Aging led that campaign, they, right? They did, yes. with the help of the AAAs. The AAAs, mm -hmm. the area mm -hmm. agencies on aging, mm -hmm. were very helpful in having these, these uh, focus groups um, mm -hmm. a, across in every corner of the Commonwealth. Yeah, the, the principal element in the governor's charge in his executive order uh, to the Department of Aging was to have the Long-Term Care Council more or less oversee the effort, but mm -hmm. he absolutely wanted to make sure there were public input sessions in every county of the Commonwealth, and that was the charge to the AAAs. Convene these sessions. They convened uh, over 200, I believe it was 227 different public meetings across the Commonwealth. I, I don't recall in the 50 years I've been in Harrisburg mm -hmm. that there was a policy initiative where they had over 200 public hearings convened all within a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, of course, the idea is to get a draft out there to the public, as Bill mentioned, uh, which is out on the 17th. And then mm -hmm. the um, public has about 30 days total uh, to be able to comment on it. So, but the so charge there were lots the of stakeholders involved in this. Many, many stakeholders. A lot. Uh, there were over 10,000 comments received. And that was a combination of the public hearings uh, that mm -hmm. the AAAs held, as well as by email, uh, text messages. I, I believe some telephone calls were made. And uh, any way that people could communicate, they were encouraged to communicate. Now, keep in mind, though, even with that 200 and some hearings and over 10,000 comments, the people who were communicating were those that either had transportation ability to do so or Internet ability to do so, for the most part. All right. So... If you didn't happen to have an internet and you didn't happen to have transportation you facility, you basic, your viewpoint was not represented directly. Now, if you were able to get some folks to help represent you, you know, then maybe it was. So we need to take the, the whole report uh, in that light as well. And remember that the people who were giving the input were those that could physically be able to do so, either because they had transportation and, of course, the cognitive, uh, cognitive ability to do so, uh, or they had an internet connection. And that was one of the big things that came up, by the way was the need for more broadband and internet connections throughout the Commonwealth for older adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what do we know at this point? What's going to be included in this report? So after all this time, after a year or so, what's mm -hmm. rising towards the top? Mm -hmm. What are the highlights here? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You go first yeah. on this one. Yeah. There, 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 the key, the two biggest issues identified everywhere was housing and transportation. Now, interestingly, with housing, and I, I checked this out with a few other states. There have been a number of other states, incidentally, that have gone through this process. And uh, housing came up there as well. But if you factor out of housing property taxes, all of a sudden housing drops down somewhat. All right. So when you look at it in terms of property taxes included in housing, that was probably the number one issue that was identified throughout all these hearings and comments. And then transportation was the second highest. No surprise there. that they could. Uh, Community senior centers uh, came up. Uh, several times, uh, mm -hmm. people wanting to make sure they were sustained because they were a valuable asset to the community and providing older adults with the kinds of things we talked about earlier. And then um, uh, from that point on, it began to be whatever was more regionally interested uh, to different people. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, housing and, and transportation. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, I agree with Roy on that one. Uh, the, the one thing is, you're right with regards mm -hmm. to the property tax, mm -hmm. that, that is a major issue here in, mm -hmm. in, in Pennsylvania. However, the housing issues is, is the different types of housing uh -huh. and getting support. And again, just because we're looking at it from a statewide angle, um, it's really the local level that's going to be able to really like. So that's why we wanted to make sure that mayors, city councils, mm -hmm. county councils, um, county executives also weighed in on this. Mm -hmm. Because when we start talking about different types of housing. Yeah, Bill, what do you mean by different types of housing? Well, for example, um, you know, we, ha we have housing where, you know, you build either a room or separate entrance on or maybe a house uh, in, in, in the backyard of, of someone. And in some areas, that's a no, no. And, and rules have to be changed. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, if you have a private entrance in the back, is that? What you're talking about? Yes, because you have to, because some people say this is, is a single family dwelling and you I can't see. have more than one ah. family living there. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say family, it's usually like, you know, you it's, it, they're called mother-in-law suites or different pieces like that where, where you give the privacy to, the, to that individual, but at the same time that they're still connected to their family or connected to someone who's going to be watching them as well to mm -hmm. make sure that they're doing okay. And, and again, those are the types of things that people are looking at, you know, downsizing from a larger home, but they're not ready to go into assisted living or they're not ready to go in someplace else, but they went the way want to be able to stay in, in their community as long as possible. And these ch changes have to be made 
at the local level by these city councils, by these mayors uh, um, and county mm -hmm. executives. Mm -hmm. You know, the, a couple of the AAAs have been experimenting with what they call the ECHO program. And, and don't ask me what the acronym is because I'm terrible with acronyms. Okay, go but, ahead. But here's the thrust of it. The, the thrust of it is to build a, a small house, and you've seen some of this on television. They're building these small houses. We've seen that tiny houses. Windows, tiny yeah. houses, exactly About the size right. of a utility shed. Yes, yeah. Yep. The tiny house that the, uh, the homeowner can bring in for mother, dad, sister, brother, whoever needs the... Uh, next to their own house. So they have that private little house, which then, when that person no longer needs that, it can be recycled somewhere else. But the biggest issue in getting across that is not the cost of it. They can be built at relatively reasonable rates. It's getting through local zoning, mm -hmm. as Bill had mentioned earlier, getting through those local uh, governments to be able to situate this for some period of time. And the period of time is really anybody's guess. I mean, how long is that individual going to remain alive and need this type of facility? All right, so what we're doing is trying to work with some uh, local government entities to be able to get them more up to speed with that this is really not a bad deal. It's actually a pretty good deal for everybody. Mm. And uh, we've had some success, but very limited at this yeah. point. It's just really- And, and the master uh -huh. plan or, uh -huh. or Aging, uh, Aging uh -huh. My Way PA uh, basically gives those guideposts. They're gonna uh -huh. base, basically say, this is what, this is what we're looking at. And, and different uh, municipalities, cities can look at this to say, okay, this is what we wanna do to make it more livable, make livable communities to mm -hmm. keep people in their homes as long as possible, mm -hmm. whether it be for transportation or housing or um, uh, social events, bike paths. I mean, this goes across mm -hmm. the board of mm -hmm. who's been involved with regards to um, uh, the master plan. Yeah, and speaking of the transportation end of it, Bill I'd like I to get into program, that, please. Uh, not long ago where uh, the, the idea came up about using Uber drivers uh, to be able to provide transportation, which is less expensive in the long run than trying to get some sort of a fixed route that would be used uh, by a bus or a van, for example. Mm -hmm. And at, I, I poo-pooed the idea. I'll be the first to oh. admit that at that particular time. We did not at ARP. We they did not. A, we I thought did. it was a great idea. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but but the, the experience I had with Uber drivers up to that point was that these individuals were just not sufficiently trained to be able to provide services to an older adult who needed assistance. Now, the, the master plan is going to speak to the idea of being able to do something like this, but with training for the individuals. Uh -huh. And if that's the case, then it becomes a much more uh, positive idea. In my the mind. drivers have to be sensitive to mobil mobility exactly. challenges. Exactly. Yeah. Mobility challenges. And what do you do with an individual who can't leave a wheelchair? Can you get, in fact, a, a van that's uh, an you Uber You have to have a vehicle to accommodate their... Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But you also have to remember the way that chair ride in some areas are mm -hmm. set up right now the person has to get, it's only curb to curb. It's not right. doorstep to doorstep. So the person has to get out of their home. They have to make it out to the van or the car. And so that's where we believe that Uber, maybe it won't help everyone, but it mm -hmm. will help a, a majority of people get to the doctor's uh -huh. office, get to, you know, whatever they need to the store. But Uber can't help with that first 50 feet from the door to the vehicle. It, no, sure, ride can't do that now. Most share mm -hmm. rides can't mm -hmm. do that now mm -hmm. either. It's, 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 it's uh, curb to curb, not doorstep to doorstep. Mm -hmm. Now that too may change. Yep. Again, the Master Plan for Aging, Aging Our Way PA, uh, is likely to have some recommendations in there that some of these requirements be waived, to use that term again, mm -hmm. or just flat out eliminated uh, because they are really not doing the job that we need done. So mm -hmm. that's also possible. And that's, and that's the great part of the Master mm -hmm. Plan mm -hmm. is that all the different, um, uh, different secretaries from across the Commonwealth mm -hmm. came together to talk about these things. Transportation. Oh, is that right? The, cap the whole cabinet came out for these that's, hearings? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Them and their, their people on their teams. And to really look at, you know, the d different mm -hmm. departments and, and how we can have this master plan integrated. And what has, what has happened is, is the, uh, the Department of Transportation is talking about share ride, talking about transportation issues and the need for changes. And that's, that would have never really come up before if it wasn't for the master plan to be mm -hmm. looking at these things. Well, in the governor's new budget proposal for mass transit, he is uh, proposing a hike. And I wonder if uh, seniors can benefit from uh, hiking uh, mass transportation statewide. Well, clearly, I believe they can. It's a whole uh, different thing than talking yeah, about Ubers. and uh, That's exactly, exactly right. Yeah. One of the other issues that came up, uh, again, in all these hearings that were held for the master plan was the issue of safety, not just you know, safety walking down the street in your neighborhood, but transportation safety as well. That was, you know, you can take that as a sidebar of transportation, if you will. So when we look at places like SEPTA, which uh, many folks have to depend on mass transit in SEPTA or out in Allegheny County as well, uh, with their system out there, or the Lehigh Valley with mm -hmm. its system, uh, rabbit transit here in this area and, and so forth, uh, the issue of upgrading 
uh, these facilities to provide better safety for the uh, customer mm -hmm. is clearly a benefit to older adults, no question about it. And then we go beyond that into what else can we do with mass transit for the amount that the governor is putting in. They just have to, to keep their routes available. and maintain exactly. low fees, too, of course, yes, it would be nice. exactly. And that's the agreement, we are told, was made with SEPTA, that they would not be raising fees, et cetera, if they were able to get this state money to do the upgrade. Now, SEPTA is just in mm -hmm. um, Philadelphia. Right. You know, so that's just one part of the state. Right. I, I yeah. think, I think one of mass transit has value to rural Pennsylvania, too. We keep sure. hearing. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. And I, I, the, the key thing, too, I think, is that that's one of the areas I, mm -hmm. that might be, you know, um, uh, discussed quite a bit when it comes to when mm -hmm. it comes to the legislature clearly um mm -hmm. you know because of the cost for sure. one piece of it mm -hmm. um I, but i think you have to keep in mind that these dollars are not going to just philadelphia and pittsburgh these dollars in mass transit people don't think about mass transit mm -hmm. when you're when you're looking at more rural areas mm -hmm. and more suburban areas but the, but bus routes in different places help people get out of their homes um you know mm -hmm. for you know to get to, to, there's so they're not socially isolated, so that they are being able to go to a friend's house, go to a senior center, mm -hmm. be able to go down to, to the store, go to the doctor's appointment. And mass transit, What? because most people, when they hear mass transit, they just think big city. They think Philly and Pittsburgh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. No, and the routes, even in those big cities, run outside of the city into other counties as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's something that is beneficial throughout the Commonwealth. But again, it has to be laid out, as Bill had indicated, there's many sections of the Commonwealth that don't really have a mass transit system. And how do we get mm -hmm. them to buy into this? Now, Roy, as you know, having been in the legislature yourself, governors mm -hmm. have a lot on their desk. So what were the forces uh, that persuaded uh, Governor Shapiro to go after this? For, for which? Just to go after the master plan for aging. Is it oh. something he just took out of his own head? Or perhaps there were forces, maybe lobbying forces, mm -hmm. said, Governor, we got to work on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. I'll just start there. I know... Um, Roy and I, mm -hmm. as well for, as example, our, for example, for example, came um, to mind. Yes, because when, again, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. as, as the governor was on his campaign trail, mm -hmm. uh, go, becoming governor, uh, this is one of the areas that we went and talked to him about personally, and and said this really has worked in other states like California, like New York, um, and some others, mm -hmm. um, and they've started the process, and we think that would be working here. We reminded him about the one in three individuals being over the age of sixty in twenty thirty, and I think. Think that really hit home with him to say, you know what, mm. we really need to be start to start thinking about this. And he, right away, I didn't, it didn't take much convincing. He went right right into the master plan and how important it was. And there's concerns for a population well older mm. than 65, 85. 85 is not 65. Maybe right. that's a group that needs a, another mm -hmm. level of care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, definitely. no question about that. And it is, in fact, those higher age groups, if you will, that are expanding more rapidly, percentage-wise. But, you know, percentage-wise eventually means real people as well. Mm -hmm. So they are expanding more mm -hmm. rapidly. The, uh, yeah, it was very, very easy to uh, convince the governor to do this. As Bill said, we spoke with him before he was elected, while he was out in the campaign trail. We spoke with the other candidate as well, because we were trying to impress upon them the importance of this. And we pointed out to them, it wasn't just so-called blue states like California and New York that were doing this. There were some other red states out there that were doing it as well, mm -hmm. Texas uh, probably being the most uh, notary of them. So the advantage we had here, I think, and, and this goes back to an earlier question you had, Larry, is we have a governor now who was a county commissioner, who was engaged in all of these issues by virtue of being in one of Pennsylvania's largest counties, Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. He brought on board to the, to the Secretary of Aging an individual who was engaged with and was an actual AAA director. An area agency on also aging local government and experience. And with local government experience. And then for the Department of Human Services, he brought on Dr. Bakush, who is also a former county commissioner in Montgomery County, also with local government and state interagency experience. Yeah. So you see <laughs> exactly. the pattern. And this is where we got really lucky in having people in these key positions that understood the interagency cooperation necessary. Uh, not just within state government, but from state government to local government and all of the non-government organizations out there that participate, the nonprofits and so on. They got it, Larry. They got it. And that, <laughs> and that, was, and that was what we were, you know, again, we didn't have to push too hard about I see. this. Right. Well, here's a change of pace uh, to our discussion, uh, gentlemen. What's in the governor's budget proposal for families dealing with Alzheimer's? I understand mm. something's being proposed there. Maybe it's a new office. Maybe it's more funding. Try to illuminate me. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, one of the one of the proposals is to have a division of alt, an Alzheimer, Alzheimer's division within the Department of Aging. Um, so there's no dedicated office for that yet. No. There, so this is kind of, this is a precedent then. Yes, it is. It's, it's the, first, the first time ever. You have to remember that there's 6.7 million people around the country 
uh, with, with uh, 65 and older living with Alzheimer's, and there's mm. at least 280,000 here in Pennsylvania. Mm. This is an issue that ev almost touches every family uh, in one way or another across the Commonwealth. Um, and there's not been anything. Yes, the Department of Aging has worked on this issue. There was a task force put together in the last administration that looked at this issue. Um, and which, uh, you know, is important. Um, but there's not been anything dedicated to say mm -hmm. these are the issues, these are the programs that we need. Mm -hmm. Who's, who's in, inside state mm -hmm. government working with the other departments, you know, with health, with human services, with insurance, um, all of these different departments that need to be focused in on this. And by having someone, having this division within the Department of Aging, it's just going to open up an, a, a whole big area of being able to support mm -hmm. these uh, individuals and their families. And if people would like to see what we're really talking about in this, take a look at Senate Bill 840. Senate Bill 840 is introduced by Senator Rosemary Brown, a Republican member of the Senate, which is good because that's the majority party there. Right. And that bill uh, outlines what is intended. Now, it's going to have to be amended because initially the intent was to put it in the Department of Health, mm -hmm. but obviously the money will be going to the Department of Aging. And I what understand, are the basics uh, of the bill, Roy, before you go any uh, deeper? Uh, yeah, the basics of the bill are to create the division, first of all, and then to have an advisory council also created, which will include a number of these people that have some impact on uh, older adults and Alzheimer's isn't restricted to just older adults, so we're going to have a number of other people in there. Um, that's the whole idea. As Bill had indicated, to be able to lay out a plan and have an official standing to be able to do so and actually implement some of the pro programs that may come up for it. Mm. How much uh, has our knowledge of Alzheimer's disease expanded? And the reason I mm. ask is whatever we've learned in recent years should certainly influence what we're spending money on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the Alzheimer's Association um, nationally as well as here in Pennsylvania have done an excellent job. You know, to, to, alone just having these Alzheimer's walks, mm -hmm. um, you know, have, have really gotten the community involved. And, and it's the numbers that I mentioned earlier, 6.7 million individuals impacted mm -hmm. by this over the age of 60, um, 65 uh, in, in the country. Um, it's impacting everyone on a daily basis. And as Roy and I see all the time, people, um, families come to services when they're in dire straits. They don't start coming when, when they just start seeing these signs of, of individuals. You know, we, we always see that people, for example, with the AAA, the Area Agencies on Aging, people are in the hospital, a, a family members in the hospital, they can't go back home. Oh, who do we call? They call, you know, in the, when they're in Then suddenly it's a crisis. It's a right. crisis and That's they have right. to do that. Same thing, in my opinion, with the Alzheimer's. Um, uh, you know, families are seeing this. It's being brought on. They, they don't know what to do. They have, uh, they have someone who's not sleeping during the night now. They have to go to work in the morning. The Alzheimer's Association, you know, has been very helpful about they have an 800 number that they can utilize. They have, they have uh, experts that can help you with these different things. And I think this division is going to be bringing all that together. Mm -hmm. uh, right mm -hmm. now it's piecemeal. And I think once it comes together under this division, it's really going to be supportive to all families across the Commonwealth. So it sounds like families with Alzheimer's uh, have something to look dementia. forward to. Or related dementia. There will be a division right. for Alzheimer's or related dementia. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, let's uh, turn to another subject, uh, gentlemen. Uh, there's uh, funding for something called the Whole Home Repairs Program. And I understand this, mm -hmm. this could concern seniors. And who can give me the basics on that program? Well, this program was just begun about a year ago with $50 million, and counties that uh, had people part trying to participate in it uh, soon discovered they had a list of applicants that was far, far greater than they could possibly And answer. what do they want, Roy? What is Basically, it Basically, as I understand it, it is a, an individual can apply for a grant of up to $10,000 for the typical home repair that would be necessary to keep their necessary home safe. Necessary repairs, yeah. Yes, necessary And this repair, is like all a, ages. It's not just for yeah, of all Understood. Ages. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and those necessary repairs could be a heating system, it could be a new roof, it could be plumbing, it could be sewage, it could be something that is absolutely necessary for them to be able to maintain a safe, uh, habitable place to live. Hmm. And in, uh, in Allegheny County alone, after they, uh, they received their share of um, whatever it was of the applications, uh, they had over 4,000 more that they couldn't fulfill. So there's an indication that there's a need out there, or at least a perception. Does that mean need. people are on a waiting list now for this? Well, there is no waiting list because that money's been used. So yeah. that's why there's another $50 million being proposed. Oh, I understand. Exactly. So once yeah. the $50 so million is so gone, popular, yeah. uh, Shapiro yes. said, let's put more money into this. Right. Yep. Right. And so, so what, what's been happening is that the AAAs, for those that are over, mm -hmm. you know, you know, over uh, age 60, have been coming to the AAAs, mm -hmm. and there's only so many dollars within the AAA network to do that. So this $50 million is going to be very helpful to be mm -hmm. able to do this. Because... 
Again, as we talked about, keeping people in the, in the community as long as possible saves everyone money. So this $50 million is, is, in my opinion, a good, a, a good start to be able to, to keep mm -hmm. them in their homes and save dollars down the road on, in the state coffers. And this will apply across many of the rural areas as well. You know, not all the poor people live in cities. There's a lot out there right. in the rural areas of Pennsylvania, and some of them don't even have actual sewage systems. They still have the old sand mound system, which may no longer be functional for their particular uh, home. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, too, is Roy's talking about some of the bigger things, that, and it does go up mm -hmm. to 10,000, but there are some smaller modifications that can be done to be helpful to keep someone, like, grab bars or, oh, or different... Oh, is that right? That can be covered, too? Yeah. Well, yeah. Now, that's usually done by the AAAs already. And that's at a modest already. expense, right? That's right. Yeah, yes. that's, that's usually done by the AAAs already. Uh, home modifications, it's called. Mm -hmm. And many people look at a home modification title and think, oh, they're going to make this place, you know, a palace. It's, it's cosmetic. No, it's only used for those kinds of safety things. As, right. as Bill indicated, it could be grab bars. It could be a ramp to be able to get in and out the door with a wheelchair, yes. something of that nature. But the AAAs, not mm -hmm. across the, the Commonwealth, but right. some AAAs do have waiting lists yes. uh, for, for, for these very individuals. Thing. So again, mm -hmm. this $50 million is going to be, uh, is across the board, is going to be very helpful. Right. And mm -hmm. after all, after all this time, you mean a lot of buildings and homes haven't been built early 20th century. Well, we're talking 100 years old. Oh, oh exactly yeah. right. Yes. Many of those buildings don't even have doorways wide enough for someone with a wheelchair to navigate to oh, the bathroom. Oh, right. They're out of date in that respect anyway. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Or, or everything that's been built in, in, in the past has been bedrooms up on the second floor um, mm -hmm. and how, how do you get someone up there you know um, right do you mm -hmm. have to re reconfigure to make a dining room into a, a into a uh, bedroom now these are the mm -hmm. kind of things that we're looking mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. now here's a topic we touched on before but I think our viewers would like to hear about it again and it's a popular topic here in PC and we hear about it all the time property tax relief <laughs> and we pointed out that uh, last year that program had been expanded and how big an expansion was that and what does the governor have on the table now for further expansion? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bill, and last year you <laughs> folks, were really, to take that you, one you on, folks were really involved yes, in that. Yes, we, we were. It, it did expand it. It did help. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think it was... How some, big an expansion? Yeah, go ahead. I think it was something like uh, 200,000 individuals uh, additional. Were added. Were added mm -hmm. to, to the program. Um, I think this expansion will hopefully double that, you know, mm -hmm. the, the one that he's mm -hmm. looking at. The specifics have not been coming out yet. I have not seen them. Right. I don't know if right. Roy has seen no, them yet, not yet or not. No. Um, but it, they're looking at expanding even mm -hmm. farther. And again, this is helping more middle-income individuals. Um, you know, as they as they raise the cap um, uh, for the, for individuals to be able to to get into this program and, and again, help seniors stay in their homes so they don't have to go to an institution. Yeah. That's right? exactly what it is. Sure, yeah. sure. And I know we sound like a broken record, right? That's I say all right. That. We say that all the time. But you know, to to make your community, to make your home more livable, keeps you in there. And again, I keep mm -hmm. on going back. It's saving dollars, taxpayer dollars down the road by keeping people out, out of facilities. Which is called cost avoidance. Cost avoidance. We have to pay a little <laughs> bit today in order to avoid paying a lot more tomorrow. Yeah. That's what, but it's very difficult to sell that to a policymaker, to a legislator. And, and the other thing, yeah. too, is I, I think, mm -hmm. you're right, right, it does take a lot to sell that to a policymaker. But I think the other thing, too, mm -hmm. is that by keeping these, uh, the property tax, as, as Roy mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, is one of the biggest things we hear at ARP across the board. Hmm. You know, people want to stay in their homes, but as, as the property tax, there's no freeze, there's no other things that it keeps on going up, and it's kind of pushing people out of their mm -hmm. homes or, or mm -hmm. making them have to leave their communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think... And that's the worry. Is that, in fact, happening? I want to make sure. Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's... And spe it depends... You know, property tax is a local issue, you know, and so it depends on, you know, where you are and how these property taxes are going up. Mm -hmm. um, there are some communities out there that don't have individual fire departments or don't have uh, police departments. Um, you so, merge with the other department a few miles over. Right. So, mm -hmm. so their property taxes are a little bit low. But if you have all of those, uh, in, you know, and, and you're not paying individually for your garbage mm -hmm. to be picked up, but it's part of, of your taxes, then right. those taxes can be quite high. And if you're, on, if you're on a fixed income, you're not working anymore. And your in, your income is fixed; it's not going up. It's, and, and and but your property taxes are. There's you have to cut in other areas, or you have to move. Sure. Now here's the irony of it: the uh, Independent Fiscal Office has just released a survey that it completed nationwide on relative tax rates across all different types of taxes. In terms of real estate tax, Pennsylvania ranks 25th, right in the middle of the group. So there's 24 states that are higher than Pennsylvania in property taxes, 24 states or so, 25 that are lower than us. But in Pennsylvania, it's such a big issue because we also are the fifth most populous state for older adults. And many of those older adults, as Bill has indicated, are living in their own homes at this point, but they're on fixed incomes. So when you take this, this huge number of people, 
even though we're in the 25th spot for property taxes, it becomes a major issue. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've really got to be able to find a way to come to grips with. But I can tell you, I've been trying to do that since 1970 when I first came to the legislature. <laughs> and, and I was just talking with some of Governor Casey's uh, former people the other day uh, right. who had tried it, of course, with a constitutional amendment on the ballot, uh, which went absolutely down. And uh, we just haven't found the answer to it. Hmm. Now, at the beginning of our program, I had asked you gentlemen about important services and programs mm -hmm. and what they're called. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you didn't let me down. You gave me a, almost a dizzying array of programs. <laughs> so in the interest of trying to just clarify some of these programs, I understand there's a new office that's going to be proposed at the health department. It's called the Long-Term Care Transformation Office. I know what long-term care is, but what's with the transformation part? That, that sounds uh, intriguing. <laughs> well, again, we're waiting to see exactly what the details are in either the so-called blue book that the department publishes, which really itemizes everything, or in front of the uh, Appropriations Committee hearings. Uh, the thrust of this idea is to be able to assist nursing homes to be able to remain open, because we've had quite a number of closures. And unfortunately, that's not going to do our older adults any good Meaning at all. permanent closures. Permanent closures, yes, yes. And again, a lot of that came out of COVID, but a lot of it also came out of the fact that they were just not able to attain enough skilled staff members to be able to remain open, or they were not able to, by shifting funds around, be able to keep the homes into the condition they really needed to keep them in. So this transitional office, uh, as I understand it, is supposed to be there to work with the nursing facilities and the nursing homes to help them get across all these different problems and concerns and be able to keep them open so that they're available for our citizens who need them. And, and the other thing is, too, I, I, Roy and I talk a lot about people staying in the community as long as possible, mm -hmm. staying in their homes. But we also want to let you know that it's important to have the spectrum of, of different uh, uh, ways of aging. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we, ultimately, we'd like to pe people to stay in their homes as long as possible. But you, the whole spectrum all the way over to a long-term care facility is needed uh, within the Commonwealth. Um, you know, so in, in everything in between with the assisted living, with the DOM care, uh, with the, the different pieces. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, are all necessary. I just want, I just want to put that out there because, sure. you know, we're always talking about people staying in their homes and that's what we want to hear. Survey after survey from... from that does the dominate ARP. the conversation here on our sure. show. Yes. Sure, yes. sure. But even with assisted living, uh, you know, I, and I know this personally because I was looking at assisted living possibilities for my mother not too long ago. Every single one I looked at would not accept an individual once they reached a certain clinical condition that required a nursing home. They would keep the individual up to that point and provided really a lot of services. Mm -hmm. But once it got to the point where they had to do things invasive, like hanging tubes and so on on somebody, right. that was nursing home. They didn't want to get involved in that. And I understand why, because that requires a very high level of skill and also a high level of um, uh, security as well. Mm -hmm. So especially if you're dealing with any kinds of drugs that happen to be opioids and what have you. So you reach a certain point, even in assisted living, where the individual and in the assisted living facility says, no, this, it's time for a skilled nursing facility. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about a basic human need, and that would be food insecurity. That seems mm -hmm. to be the phrase we're hearing a lot of in the last several years. And is there anything in the governor's budget proposal that can address that? There is. Um, so uh, the, there is food insecurity. It's across the, it's across the board, but it mm -hmm. does impact um, older Pennsylvanians quite a bit. Uh, there's $3 million that are going in uh, to reduce this through the SNAP program, which is the mm -hmm. old food stamp program. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and what it does is I think it raises it from, which is not a lot, 25 to $35 for individuals. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of money. But mm -hmm. what it also does is it, it, it boosts the senior um, food box program, which are these boxes that food banks put together for uh, for individuals and then seniors uh, can come and it's a box for the whole week that they're uh -huh. able to you have to come and pick it up either uh, yes there are some places that do deliver it but mm -hmm. for the most part you'd have to have okay. either you or a family mm -hmm. member would have to come and, and pick it up mm -hmm. so yes there's a little bit of money e even for for food insecurity which is great mm -hmm. in this you know and there's likely to be uh, more freedom for community senior centers which are providing a nutritious meal at least one nutritious meal a day in a congregate setting there's likely to be more flexibility for them to actually have what we're calling grab and go. That would became popular during the COVID period when an individual would pull up in their automobile. A lot of us did that regardless box. of age. <laughs> That's exactly go. right. They'd hand them the box, and they'd, but, but basically they got their nutritious meal for the day that way. Mm -hmm. We expect that that's going to be able to continue. So, again, relieving some of these restrictions will make it easier to address that food insecurity as well. Mm -hmm. Now, let's consider we have a few minutes left in our, our program 
so let's consider the last uh, budget. Well, there was an impasse. I think everybody would agree on that yeah. because it was due last June and it was not finalized until last December. So was there some noticeable impact to senior services? I, I'd like to know. The, the answer is both yes and no. Uh, there was clearly noticeable impact in a number of the area agencies on aging and the other providers uh, who get their contracts in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're concerned about not being able to be paid on time. They didn't have lines of credit that might be long enough to be able to carry them through. And even if they did, they'd have to pay interest on it. So you had all of those concerns. It didn't become a crisis, however, because those important portions were settled early enough. Uh, will we face something of that this year? We're already seeing some concern about it, frankly, because mm. the response was from the other side of the aisle, if you will, uh, in the Senate, which is extremely important, um, was about money, not about the policy or about the issues. When the governor presented his budget, he laid everything on the table, including the kitchen sink. So there was a lot to choose mm. from, all right? But the response uh, from the majority uh, party in the Senate was all about money. We sure. can't afford it. It's going to bankrupt the Commonwealth. No discussion about policy. I would advise all listeners and so on to just not get involved in that war of words. Really don't even pay attention to it. Because when we go through the budget hearings and so forth and get into the negotiations, that's when the policy decisions, decisions are going to be made. And they can be justified and they as can well. can be justified. Exactly right. Because on, the, on this war of words right now, both sides are not entirely wrong. Both sides are not entirely right. Mm -hmm. You know, what the governor is suggesting is expensive. He wants to draw down $3 billion out of the $14 billion uh, reserve that's out there. And on the other side of the aisle, they're saying, well, you can't do that because these are continuing costs. And if we're going to bankrupt ourselves in four or five years, that just assumes that nothing else will change change, that no further policy decisions will change what is there today. On the other mm -hmm. hand, if you look at the idea that I believe the governor's people are looking at, which are saying cost avoidance, let's spend some money now to make sure that people are healthier and don't have to go into the more expensive settings down the road. And then on the other side of that, are we going to get some mm -hmm. revenue in without actually raising taxes? And he's proposed at least two things. One is legalizing marijuana. And the other is uh, legalizing the so-called skill games right. and bringing in a significant tax portion between the two of them, half a billion dollars uh, just on those two. But on the marijuana thing, you know, this is also interesting because there's a greater savings. If you're now legalizing adult use of marijuana, hmm? you're saving money on the idea of investigation, arrests, prosecution, criminalization in terms of incarceration or probation, judicial time. All of that is a savings because you're doing away with that. So you add that into it as well. So there's a number of things to be discussed and to just simply say nothing is going to change is just not realistic. And I guess the key thing too, what Roy is saying is that, you know, we're excited about, mm. about you know, the, the mm. portions of the budget that are really impacting older mm -hmm. Pennsylvanians. Um, but again, what the governor does is he, he puts out his budget, he lays it out on the table as, as Roy said, everything yeah. and the kitchen sink. Yeah. And, and his speech was an hour and a half after all, so he had a lot to say. He had a lot that. to say, yes, exactly. He, he, was, he was very excited <laughs> about it, you know, um, uh, you know, getting stuff done. And, and we we're, I'm excited. You know, ARP is excited about hearing getting mm -hmm. stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's one piece of, of, of it. It basically means that the Senate and the House also have to come to agreement on this. He's mm -hmm. only laying it out. The other, the other piece that I think is very important is that you have to remember, if you just add up everything that we've talked about here today, it's a rounding error when it comes to the multi-billion dollar budget. Mm -hmm. And these programs mm -hmm. impact a face, the faces of a Pennsylvanians, these programs. So, you know, and they help them live their lives on a daily basis um, compared to some of these mm -hmm. other bigger things. So again, I just want to make that point. It's a yeah. rounding error, mm -hmm. and I think it's important that, that we look at it that way and we get these things accomplished and, and the programs out there. Sure, and in terms of the negotiation, let me invoke the ghost of my dear friend Bill Klosaritz once again from Kutztown University. <laughs> the second thing he would tell his class We're is making right a full on circle day one. With that professor. <laughs> yeah, like that's that. exactly right. The, first, the second thing he would tell his classes on day one was the essence of government is this, and that is to allocate limited resources among unlimited demands and to do so in a peaceful fashion. That's what we'll see in the budget negotiations. And that's how we're going to end our program. Our guests have been Roy Offlerbach, founder and president of the Offlerbach Group and a former state senator, and Bill Johnston Walsh, director of AARP of Pennsylvania. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. That's Thank it for Focus on Aging Adults. I'm Larry Casper. Thanks for watching. story
story begins more than 60 years ago inside an abandoned chicken coop where our founder discovered a retired teacher living. No home, no health care. So she said no to this injustice and yes to transforming lives. It's this drive, this compassion that inspired AARP. Today, we empower people to choose how they live as they age. We advocate for health and financial security. We strengthen communities everywhere. We are AARP Pennsylvania, creating real possibilities. Focus on Aging Adults is sponsored in part by AARP.